Hello, all you freedom-loving people. Welcome to another episode of Front Page. I'm your host, Scott Cameron Goulet. U.S. intelligence agencies have revealed that the Iranian hackers who hacked President Trump's campaign tried to share this information with President Joe Biden's campaign. The Teamsters Union may not be endorsing a specific candidate this time for the first time since 1966, but internal polling shows how most of the union members will cast their votes anyway. The House failed to pass a stopgap spending bill, largely due to the bill including the measure of requiring proof of citizenship to vote. Venezuela's opposition leader, who was forced to flee the country, has revealed that he was forced to sign a document saying that he agrees that he lost the election, otherwise he wouldn't have been able to avoid being arrested. Sweden has had enough of illegal immigrants and is offering to pay them to leave. Okay, let's get into it. On Wednesday, multiple U.S. intelligence agencies revealed that the Iranian hackers who hacked President Trump's campaign tried to share the information with President Joe Biden's campaign in a move that the FBI believes was an attempt to influence the 2024 election. A group of Iranian hackers hacked into President Trump's and President Biden's presidential campaigns this summer. The FBI, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency said that the hackers also tried to send private information from the Trump campaign to the U.S. media. However, the agencies did not indicate whether any of the information was ever published. According to the agencies, Iran has been stirring up tensions and trying to undermine our elections. They also warned that Russia and China are trying to exacerbate divisions in the United States. The Trump campaign commented on the new development. Trump campaign spokeswoman Caroline Leavitt stated, This is further proof the Iranians are actively interfering in the election to help Kamala Harris and Joe Biden because they know President Trump will restore his tough sanctions and stand against their reign of terror. Kamala and Biden must come clean on whether they used the hack material given to them by the Iranians to hurt President Trump. What did they know and when did they know it? On Wednesday, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters said, it would not endorse a presidential candidate. Since 1966, this is the first time that the Teamsters have declined an endorsement. The Teamsters general president, Sean O'Brien, stated, Neither major candidate was able to make serious commitments to our union to ensure the interests of working people are always put before big business. We sought commitments from both Trump and Harris not to interfere in critical union campaigns or core Teamster industries and to honor our members' right to strike, but were unable to secure those pledges. On the same day, the union released an internal polling showing that more than half of its members favor President Trump over Vice President Kamala Harris. The union will not be endorsing either candidate this time around, but the poll that was conducted from September 9th to September 15th showed that 58% of union members back President Trump with only 31% favoring Harris. The Teamsters with roughly 1.3 million members, is one of the largest labor unions in the United States. On Wednesday, the House of Representatives failed to pass a temporary spending fix that would have avoided a government shutdown. In a 202 to 220 vote, the House rejected the GOP measure that would have extended government funding by six months. This included 14 Republicans who voted against it, while three Democrats supported it and two members voted present. Aside from delaying the funding deadline from September 30th to March of 2025, the bill included the Safeguard American Voter Eligibility Act, the SAVE Act. This act would have required proof of citizenship to register to vote. Democrats overwhelmingly opposed the plan. Instead, they called for a three-month stopgap bill with no policy riders. This type of bill is known as a clean continuing resolution. They rejected the SAVE Act, claiming that it's an unnecessary measure since the existing laws already bar non-citizens from voting. Republican objections to the spending plan came from various groups. Some Republicans object to the use of continuing resolutions. 
Others believe that the spending figures are too high. And some say that a six-month stop gap would leave the military unfunded for too long. So now that the bill has failed, House Republican leaders will have to go back to the drawing board. A federal judge agreed to delay Hunter Biden sentencing for his three felony gun charges that he was convicted of in June. The judge pushed the sentencing back for three weeks. Hunter Biden's sentencing is now scheduled for December 4th. His sentencing was originally already slated for after the election. However, his attorney asked to delay the November 13th date. This was because of the overlap with Hunter Biden's other ongoing legal battles. Special counsel David Weiss opposed the delay. However, U.S. District Judge Mary Ellen Arika, in a brief order, quickly agreed to the request. Hunter Biden faces 25 years in prison. And before we move on, I want to remind you that we have extra content that we published on Ganjing World. We cover the news of Arizona discovering nearly 100,000 registered voters who hadn't shown proof of citizenship. So to watch this news story, please go to our Ganjing World platform. I'll leave the link in the description below. On Wednesday, a federal grand jury in Alaska indicted a man for making hundreds of violent threats to injure and assassinate six justices of the U.S. Supreme Court and their families. Panos Anastasio was arrested over the allegations. He allegedly sent more than 465 messages to the Supreme Court using a public website that the court runs. This happened between March 10, 2023 and July 16, 2024. His messages contained violent, racist, and homophobic rhetoric, coupled with the threats of assassination by torture, hanging, and firearms. He threatened to kill justices in ways like lynching and beheading. He also encouraged others to act against the justices. He allegedly said that he would kill two justices and their family members. Anastasio said in a message that he would kill them by sending fellow veterans of the Vietnam War to spray their homes with bullets. He also allegedly threatened a former United States president. However, court records do not specify which president. Anastasio allegedly wrote that he hoped to see former President One and Supreme Court Justice One hanging together from an oak tree. Anastasio is charged with nine counts of threats against a federal judge and 13 counts of threats to interstate commerce. If convicted, he faces up to 10 years in prison for each count of threats against a federal judge, and he also faces up to five years in prison for each count of interstate commerce threat. Venezuelan opposition leader Edmundo Gonzalez has said that he was forced to sign a letter accepting that he had lost July's presidential election to Nicolas Maduro. By doing so, they allowed him to leave and go to Spain as an exile. Otherwise, he would have been arrested. Gonzalez said he signed the letter under duress at the Spanish embassy in Caracas. On Wednesday, in a video that was published on social media, Gonzalez explained that they showed up with the document that I would have to sign to allow my departure from the country. In other words, either I signed or I would face consequences. There were very tense hours of coercion, blackmail, and pressure. The document that Gonzalez signed was supposed to be confidential. However, the head of the National Assembly for Venezuela, who is also the chief negotiator for Maduro, presented it during a nationally televised press conference this week. He claimed at the press conference that Gonzalez signed the letter voluntarily. The National Electoral Council of Venezuela declared Maduro the winner of the July 28th presidential election. This was despite the evidence that suggested he lost in a landslide to Gonzalez. The opposition obtained voting tallies, which suggested that Gonzalez had won 73% of the available votes. This was twice as many as Maduro had received. The United States and numerous other countries also said that they do not recognize Maduro as president. 
Sweden is making radical changes to its immigration policy. The official website for the government of Sweden said, Sweden's migration policy is undergoing a paradigm shift. The government is intensifying its effort to reduce the number of migrants coming irregularly to Sweden. It also promised to deport those who are there without authorization. Johan Forsell, who is the Minister of Migration, announced that they would pay up to $34,000 for migrants to return to their home of origin. This came after the right-wing bloc took over the government last week. The government includes an anti-immigrant wing that criticizes the lack of integration of migrants from the former Yugoslavia, Syria, Afghanistan, Somalia, Iran, and Iraq. To preserve their traditional culture and native language, the country is now intensifying efforts to toughen its asylum system. It even calls for a complete phase-out of permanent residence permits. Jimmy Ackeson, who is the leader of the Sweden Democrats, said, It's time to start rebuilding security, welfare, and cohesion. It's time to put Sweden first. The Sweden Democrats will be a constructive and driving force in this work. Ireland is faced with a dilemma that is the envy of other countries. How to spend more than 14 billion euros that have fallen from the sky. The European Court of Justice ruled last week that Apple needs to pay 13 billion euros in back taxes to the Irish government. With interest, that amount comes to $14.1 billion. This figure is equivalent to 14% of the government's revenue this year. But the Irish government is actually not keen on this huge fine from Apple. When the European Union's Executive Committee initiated an investigation into Apple in 2014 and demanded two years later that the Irish authorities recover 13 billion euros in unpaid taxes from Apple, the Irish authorities were actually very angry about this, thinking that the European Union had stretched its hand too far. As a result, the Irish government and Apple teamed up together to appeal this ruling in 2019. A year later, the EU's General Court issued a ruling asking the Commission to revoke its 2016 ruling. They stated that the Commission had failed to prove that Ireland had given Apple a tax break. But the EU's Executive Committee was not convinced and they appealed to a higher court, the Court of Justice. And the Court of Justice ruled in favor of the EU this month. The court held that Ireland had allowed Apple to enjoy an unfair tax advantage over the past 20 years, which must now be recovered. In a statement, the Irish government rejected the EU's allegation, claiming that no tax concession had been offered to any companies or taxpayers, but they said that it was respectful of the final ruling. This is where this huge sum of money comes from. With so much money all of a sudden, how should they spend it? The government's new budget does not include Apple's back taxes. So the whole of Ireland, from lawmakers to journalists, are searching for an answer to this question, from reducing the national debt to investing in railways, housing, hospitals, building bicycle parking spaces, investing in the future, and even giving out welfare benefits. There are all sorts of suggestions. There is no more direct way to do so than to issue a one-time benefit. For a small European country with a population of less than 6 million and a strong financial position, if this money were paid directly to citizens as a one-time subsidy, it would be equivalent to about 2,530 euros for everyone from adults to children. Of course, this is going to cause inflation. Obviously, not a good idea. Prime Minister Simon Harris said that the money would not be spent on day-to-day -day expenses and it could not be put into the national pension. The money should be spent on more pressing social issues such as infrastructure and housing shortages. He said that Ireland had deficiencies in housing, water and energy and needs to invest in these areas. The opposition called on the government to spend the money immediately to solve housing crisis, the shortage of medical facilities and other imminent social problems. 
In eight years, the government has spent more than 10 million euros on lawyers in the Apple case. The leader of the opposition party, Mary Lou MacDonald, criticized the government for taking eight years to fight the EU as reckless and unforgivable. And that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you so much for your support of Front Page. Please remember that every like, comment, and share helps more people to see the truth. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you have already subscribed, we thank you. But please double check to make sure that you're still subscribed because some of our audience have reported that they're somehow unsubscribed without their knowledge. We've also heard that many of you don't get notifications of our videos anymore on YouTube. So when you do subscribe on YouTube, please make sure to tap the notification bell as well. Okay, this is our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends and family because everybody deserves to know the truth. Thank you.